<laughs> yeah, good evening and welcome. I'd like to begin with acknowledging that Kathleen and I are standing on indigenous and central ancestral lands here in Portland. And James, you are home on the Umatilla Reservation where you are an enrolled member of the Walla Walla tribe of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Reservation. It is truly a pleasure and an honor to introduce James Lavador and Kathleen Ash Milby. James, you are so respected and your paintings are so loved by both young and old that it's no long, no wonder that your work can be found in museums across the country, including the Smithsonian's Museum of American Indian, the Whitney Museum of American Art, Crystal Ridges, and most importantly, our museum, the Portland Art Museum. Kathleen, Kathleen Ash Milby, we were thrilled when you came to Portland to become the curator of Native American art at the Portland Art Museum. You are bringing your experience and accomplishments from being an associate curator at the National Museum of American Indian, where you organize numerous Native American art ex exhibitions nationally and internationally, including as curator of the American Indian Community House Gallery in New York City. And Kathleen is a member of the Navajo tribe. Thank you, James. Thank you, Kathleen, for letting us join in on your conversation. Thank you so much, Jane. We really appreciate your support and your initiative to make this program happen. Hi, James. Hi. Thank you, Janie. Yeah, we're both really happy to be here um, and to talk about art because I think that uh, James and I um, have known each other since I, well, I met him in person actually in 2006 with a studio visit that I was doing to organize the exhibition Off the Map Landscape in the Native Imagination at the National Museum of the American Indian. And, you know, James, it's always fun to talk with you about art. And I love to talk to artists and hear about their practice. And um, I'm really looking forward to talking about, about your work tonight. Wonderful, I'm, I'm excited. Great. So what conversation about art is complete without pictures art. of art? <laughs> so um, one of the things that I did in preparing for this is um, look at which works were here in the collection of the Portland Art Museum. Um, I am fairly recent to Portland and the Portland Art Museum. I've only been here just over a year and I'm still in this process of learning about the collection. And it is really wonderful to see that your work is so well represented in the collection. And actually there's quite a range of work um, spanning several decades. Um, it's always great when museums are able to represent an artist's work in depth. And I think because your work is so important to the region, it really makes a whole lot of sense that we have such a great and wide collection of your work. So I found this gem from the Wayback Machine. It's the Wayback Machine. <laughs> and probably a surprise to people who aren't familiar with your work um, from, from further back in your career. Because I really think that your, your landscape inspired paintings are what people think of when they hear your name. And to see something like this is really a surprise. Yeah. Well, this is quite a while ago too. And uh, when, I, I don't know, let's see, it's 87, oh my God, 1987. Well, I, um, let's see, I don't even know where to begin. I was working with uh, figurative ideas coming out of the land. You know, the way I look at the land, um, I see things in the land. You know, I see uh, figures, uh, you, you drive by rock cliffs and there's every form imaginable, you know, and sometimes I feel like the land is sort of uh, uh, talking to me, you know, as I go by, kind of like uh, pressing its nose up against the window like a puppy, you know, every time you go by, they want to know what's going on with you, you know, there's this personal connection with um, where I am. And back then I was obsessed with everything being uh, a memory, uh, everywhere a ghost, you know, every rock, a story, every, every, everything, you know, the wind, the land, the water, 
And uh, so I, I did a lot of figurative stuff that came out of the land itself. I didn't really invent the uh, forms. They just sort of appeared in, in the process of painting. And there were a lot of skeletal forms that seemed to come out, not necessarily, like when I look at this image, I, I can see a human, but not completely a human. It almost yes. seems like an animal skull. Well, there are a lot of, uh, you know, traditionally up down the Columbia River, there's a, a skeletal design, you know, that a Wasco design that shows, you know, the, the bones and the, the skull and that. And there's a lot of petroglyphs up and down the river that have, uh, you know, different kinds of um, figurative things going on. So um, I think that's where initially uh, you know, I may have gotten the idea back there, a lot, a, along with things I was reading at the time, you know, I was reading a lot of Latin American literature at the time. So everything was haunted, everything had a story, uh, a past. Um, I was trying to get a grip on what I was doing as an artist in, in the world and uh, going through everything, everything in my brain, everything in my mind, you know, but uh, um, this period was really a fertile period. Um, the late 80s. I, I, I think the piece that went to the um, uh, Whitney Museum was from this time period. Uh, the palette's very different also from your current work. It yes, seems it like is. it really fits with that idea of, of haunting and ghosts and memory. I had a very limited palette. I worked um, in a uh, sort of a monochrome fashion for years and I was basically I was just trying to understand paint and uh, seeing what happens in paint. Paint was uh, it's the um, <clears throat> it's this cosmic event in paint that causes form you know I mean, in paint uh, it um, flows and there's hydrology uh, sedimentation, separation, uh, all kinds of crystalline structures that that appear in the, in the um, uh, uh, erosion of of pigment, just like the land itself. The paint and and the land are really the same thing. The same thing happens. So I'm always searching for something in paint. And for this period of time, I think I used a monochrome because color was just too much to think about. <laughs> you know, I, I, I go back and I eliminate or I, I, uh, uh, I, I go back to very basic elemental things when I start a new body of work. I don't have big ideas, I have small ideas. And I start a rolling, you know, and pretty soon it starts accumulating and all these things happen. Um, new avenues, new new things appear, you know, things I hadn't considered, things I haven't seen before. You know. Well, I, I really love this piece. I feel like the more that I look at it, the more that I see, which is a quality that I find in your work generally is just that you get an impression of it. And then I think the sign of a really accomplished painter is that the more you look at something, the more you find in it. And this Hopefully. in particular, one of the things that I actually am liking more and more as I look at this piece is the way that the ribs are are rendered. You know, they're so dimensional. You know, they're they're they've really got a I don't know a presence, a vibration almost there going on. Okay, so let's look at another one from our collection. Um, this was an interesting piece. It's a monotype, and it is also figurative. But I think it also fits in with what you were talking about, about these, these kind of um, amorphous forms that are a, an idea or a memory or an impression and not super literal. You know, a thing I used to do is I, I every spring I would go out and hike and find a great spot on the hillside and take a nap. You know, just kind of like <laughs> spread eagle and take a nap and let the land just sort of, uh, you know, inform you, consume you, you know, and that's how I think about uh, an image like this. It's a very simple image. It, it, this, this was done at actually at, uh, at the old PNCA um, at, at, the, at the museum, Portland Art uh, Museum uh, with uh, Tom Prochaska and Christy Wyckoff when they used to teach there. They had a thing called monomania and uh, 
this is one of the prints we made back then. Have you worked a lot with prints or is this just something that you? That was the first time I worked with prints, very first time. And um, I went on to work with uh, uh, another print studio in Portland. Uh, uh, what was it? Vicki Vanderslice and Myrna Burks had a, had a studio and I worked with them. Then I went off to Rutgers and I worked uh, with uh, Eileen Foti at Rutgers. And that's where I learned uh, lithography. Okay. Well, I love this, um, these monotypes because, uh, you know, I feel like there's really, it's almost like a, br a brush stroke. Um, you can really feel your hand in that background with the, the moving around, the pushing around of the pigment on the plate. Um, and also the way the, the, it's almost like an after image of a skeleton superimposed on the, the form of the, of the person who almost seems like they're engulfed in flames. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and right now this is like, I think very apropos. I mean, we're dealing with so yeah. much having to do with fire and destruction. And um, I really feel like this, this piece speaks to the present moment. I, I, I suppose I, you know, I, I look at it, I think of what I was doing with the pigment, you know, I wasn't thinking of really the effect that the image is having on me, you know, the, the, usually the image is, um, for me, uh, secondary, you know, it's, um, it's a vehicle for all this stuff that's going on in the paint. And, uh, and you know, you of course, it. what's that? I was just gonna say, it's like, then you scratched out the outline, you scratched away the pigment around the, the head of the figure, it looks like. Yeah, just a pencil. You know, just a, a little outline you kind know, of goes around it. The paint's very wet. And as you work with it, it sets up, gets kind of tacky. And so it's easier to go in and, and uh, make a line like that. But when it's wet, uh, all that, uh, uh, you know, the bottom part and the yellow part, uh, you know, it's, it's very fluid. And uh, I like to get it roiled up. You know, so something dynamic emerges out of it. That's a great way to describe this work. Okay, let's see one more. We have this is the the third and last image. We have many more pieces in the collection, but this is just a, a, a few that I picked out. Body of my bodies, 1992. So this really shows or demonstrates when you started using multiple panels to create these these more complex works. Mm -hmm. Well, this, this uh, the title Bodies of My Body was taken from a poem uh, by Octavio Paz, it's a phrase. And <clears throat> yeah, these were, uh, let's see, when was this? 92. 92, yeah, I think this was, uh, uh, oh yeah, this was in Seattle. This was exhibited in Seattle at the Cliff Michelle Gallery, I think. I believe, yeah. And it was a really productive time. I was working uh, on linen canvas at the time, stretched linen. And that's before I went to, uh, I moved over to uh, wood panels. Um, it was, um, I don't know, you know, a painting like this gets started and it's like writing a book or something, you know, you, you start uh, delving into it and it gets deeper and more complicated and, uh, uh, things arise, you know, and uh, pretty soon the whole thing becomes alive. And um, I think of paintings as uh, as devices, you know, to um, the whole purpose of a painting is to look at it and to raise, uh, uh, to expand our, our perceptive abilities, you know, to look into something, to see its particulars, and with our reflective faculties, we begin to um, discover things, uh, see things that we didn't see before. And each time we come back, there's something more because this isn't drawn. You know, this is, uh, this is an actual explosion of paint, boom. You know, so uh, the stuff that, that happens is sort of articulated nature. You know? <laughs> you know, a pattern starts to happen and a rhythm and pretty soon the whole thing starts to get involved. You know, usually these paintings, I, I do maybe, I don't know, 
maybe 50, 60 paintings before I, I compose a painting like this. You know, so I have a lot of paintings to pull from, to compose with and to create sort of um, uh, this, this thing that's happening, this contemplated perceptive event. And uh, what it means, I don't know. I have no idea. You know, uh, what does nature mean? What does life mean? I don't, I, I don't know, you know, but I learn a lot. You know, that's, that's what painting is for me. Uh, it's, it's a way of uh, acquiring knowledge about who I am, what I am, where I am, who we are. And, and uh, it's interesting, the more I get into painting, how much it connects with other painting that's gone on in the world, you know, um, and how much we have in common as uh, human beings, you know, the, uh, the oneness of uh, humanity uh, is something that I'm uh, very interested in. <laughs> I want peace in the world. Uh, I noticed that um, in this um, painting, the top left panel, there's a figure. Is this, uh, at what point did you stop putting figures in your work and, and why did you choose to eliminate them altogether. This was when I stopped putting figures in work because I don't know what they're doing. And I was interested in something more um, instead of something. Um, a figure represents a symbol and it's it's um, it holds a place for some, you know, some human thought. Um, and um, but as I got more into painting, uh, all that started to fade. I, I went off to Rutgers. I, when I first started making prints, I, I, uh, I worked with uh, Eileen Foti. Uh, and um, while I was there, there was a fellow named uh, uh, Norman J. Zabuski. He was uh, uh, in charge of the physics department at, at Rutgers. And he was inviting artists over and to have discussions about different ways to show um, <clears throat> the principles of physics uh, without mathematics. And so he was encouraging artists to understand and to uh, come, because they have all the tools, they have all the toys. You know, the science department has <laughs> a thing that's called the, uh, what they call it? The cave, I think is what they call it. But it has audio, visual, and all kinds of incredible, um, you know, uh, technology that, you know, the art department, you know, they have brushes and pencils and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's, he looked at my paintings and uh, we had a, uh, you know, just a short meeting. And uh, he said, well, you know what this is? And I, at, at the painting, it had some drips. And I said, well, they're drips. And he said, no, <laughs> he said that they're, it, it's, um, these are fingering instabilities from uh, the cosmic flow. And he explained to me the cosmic vortex and, and the principle of flow and uh, fingering instabilities. And I, all of a sudden I thought, <laughs> I'm literally, <laughs> you know, I don't have to make things that mean things anymore. You know, I don't have to break my brain to, you know, it, it, then it became more like music, you know, uh, um, a painting became more like sound, you know, more like light, more like earth. You know, I, it wasn't uh, hindered by my ability or lack of ability to come up with a narrative, you know, which I'm not a wordsmith and I, that's not what I, you know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm more like a rock hound. You know, I, I go out and I, I sift through things and I, I discover things. I don't really, um, I don't know what, you know, who knows what's out there. I think people will bring the narrative to the work. Yeah. They do. You know, because I think people are always looking for um, stories, you know, and relationships. And, you know, in this period, I think that your work appeared a much more representational. You know, I can look at this and say, well, this looks like a body of water and this is like mist. And, you know, you can kind of relate this a lot more directly to a physical representation of a landscape. But over time, it seems like your work has become much more abstract. It still has a lot of these same elements, but it seems like you were freeing yourself from the constraints of what was expected in terms of depicting things like landscape. Well, I, I worked in two 
um, veins. I, I did, I already made abstract expressionist type paintings and uh, I did landscapes. So they were sort of, uh, the abstract things were structural um, abstractions and the landscapes were these organic uh, flowing, uh, undulating uh, things like this, you know, and uh, they were separate for years. After this period of time, um, uh, is probably a, another eight to 10 years, they, they kind of <laughs> collided uh, the abstract and, and the landscape into what I'm doing now. Great. Well, let's jump ahead um, quite a few decades to your current work. Um, the next um, images that I'm going to show are all included in the current exhibition at um, PDX Contemporary Art. Um, and the title of the of this show is Expecting Rain. And, and this is the, the work titled Expecting Rain. And it's a massive, you know, multiple paneled piece compared to the other one. Um, amazing palette. I'm, yeah, I find this, um, this palette so exciting and um, I, cheerful is not the right word, but I, I really enjoy seeing these colors dancing on these paintings. So what, what can you tell us about, about this work? Well, it's uh, my daily practice for two and a half years. You know, I, I worked on this. This is about, probably about 25% of the work I was doing or I am doing, you know. Um, I'm still working on the other ones, I, I guess is what I mean. Um, so it's very intense work. Um, I, my first year working on this, um, it just got um, the whole body of work, not just these 18, about 100 paintings. They all rose up to a certain kind of level and uh, uh, they just kept piling up and I couldn't push it further. You know, I, I, I don't know what it was, but, uh, um, you know, eventually I, I found a way to make the whole thing move again and started flowing. And so I think of work a lot of times in, in uh, because I'm, I'm doing it every day. Sometimes these paintings are upside down and sideways and, and dripping. And sometimes um, uh, I turn it upside down to make the image, um, you know, because the more I work on it, the more I pile paint and the more, um, uh, patterns uh, emerge and, and happen in, in the piece itself, uh, it really shapes itself, you know, and, and the final thing usually is a um, horizon line, you know, that's kind of what sets the tone, contains the energy of the piece. These are all really like uh, wound up rubber band balls, you know, they have, they have a lot of compressed energy in, in the image itself, you know, you just can't look at it and and um, you know it, it grabs you and pulls you through this whole process like a uh, I don't know there is currents uh, um, uh, there is a zigzag 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 pattern light cool light cool um, warm cool warm cool um, uh, <clears throat> so there's a whole bunch of different uh, uh, dynamic uh, things happening in the image that aren't all that obvious until you start looking at it and uh, realize that it's, you're being pulled around the entire thing. And it, it reminds me of, uh, I started doing these things, uh, this, um, uh, you know, these uh, multiple panel pieces. Uh, initially I did them because I, uh, I, I do so much work and they're all sort of, uh, you know, they're, they're not uh, balanced. And usually I, it takes two, two paintings to balance a movement that's happening. And uh, I begin to realize that I could expand that out into a, a larger, larger way. And the colors I use are more like, um, I live around a lot of uh, people who do beadwork and uh, uh, weaving, and especially weaving. That's um, uh, plateau weaving has a lot to do with my my design, you know. So these have sort of a a checkerboard pattern that could be, you know, it, it could be a number of things. It could be a sun. It could be a moon. It could be uh, uh, different types of uh, uh, 
patterns that create, you know, these simple things, horizon, moon, sun, um, that, that kind of thing. So um, the painting itself, you know, it, it really, uh, I love the color, you know, I, I you know, that, that, I, that kind of uh, um, magenta, I don't know what it is, but it makes me, it just breaks my heart, you know, it's just such a ugh, paint uh, color, you know, and um, you can overdo it, you know, I, 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 I do overdo it, you know, I, I and it, uh, so I have to tone it down a little bit. Uh, um, and that's what encourage, encourages me to uh, get other colors going, you know, is to weigh that magenta out because it's such a powerful color, but uh, it's and, not and, often I get to use it. Well, it's fantastic. Um, I think probably also your choice of working with oil paint also contributes to that vibrancy and that oh, yeah. um, kind of um, a little bit of a transparency, but there's just something very vivid about the way these colors are interacting with each other that I don't think you could get with acrylic. No, I, well, I don't think you can. I've never been able to anyway. The thing about these and the reason I, I work on wood is oil paint is, um, you know, it's made to be layered. Uh, and the, I, I usually, the way I work, I, you know, if I use a dark color, then the next one is a light. If I use a red, the next one's going to be a green. If I use yellow, it's going to be a, a violet or a purple. If I use an orange, it'll, you know, uh, there's a, a, a color system I use, but I use, uh, I switch back from opaque to uh, transparent. And that's what creates that surface uh, depth. So a lot of the color like that, uh, the blue in the upper uh, right hand corner, um, that's a blue glaze over the top of a white underpainting. So it, it just sort of uh, glows like a, a tail light on a car. I like that kind of um, saturated color. I, you know. Yeah, it's color, great. You should use color. Yeah, I agree. Okay, let's do another one. So, I mean, unfortunately, because we're looking at things on a screen, I think that that previous work doesn't really have the impact it would, you know, you're not really getting that monumentality because we have to shrink it down to fit it on the screen. Um, these next images are um, fewer, you know, fewer panels. And, and I think it's a lot easier for folks to just really see that intensity and the amount of detail, like in this piece, Crazy Deep. Well, you can see that there's probably, I don't know. I've been working on these for um, these, this, this, this one, uh, these two paintings. Actually, it's, it was 50 paintings. I've been working on them since uh, about 2010. So there's a lot of layers here. And uh, um, they're like, I, I think of it like a rolling a rock down a hill. You know, you just start it rolling and then as it goes along, it accumulates uh, things as it, as it rolls down to its eventual uh, repose, I guess is what you could call it. It doesn't really end. But there's so many layers that it creates this uh, surface uh, depth. Um, it's not, when, when you see these in person, uh, uh, the light goes through you know, the, the transparent layer and, and bounces back. So they have a certain kind of glow about them. I hope we're inspiring people to come see these in person. Here's another one. This one's called Backfire. Again, the fire imagery. Yeah, I like red. You know. uh -huh. <laughs> um, I don't, I, you know, it, the, this is an, another painting, you know, they, a lot of my paintings hang around for, well, if I work on them for years and years and years, you know, they, they're all in stacks. You know, I have uh, various sizes and various things that happen, various techniques, you know, so I've got them all separated. And uh, uh, sometimes I don't know what to do with them. I work on it and something happens and I have no clue and I just stick it back in the pile and bring something else out and work on it. And this is a painting like that. It's been kicked around for many years. And finally, I just kind of uh, figured it out, you know? And I don't know why. Some days I can figure it out. Some days I can't. I have no clue. And some days I, I am 
I could do work on maybe seven to 10 paintings in a day. And some days I can only do one, you know, but uh, I, so, it's a mysterious thing. <laughs> do you ever completely abandon a panel? Do you ever just look at a panel and just say that this is, I can never, this is just not working and paint over it, like gesso over it, or is this, oh, yeah. does it just stay in the back closet? <laughs> no, I, if it comes home from the gallery, it gets painted on again, usually. So I, wow. I did a large piece, um, well, uh, a couple of years ago for um, uh, Converge uh, at, um, oh, what's their, just Jeff that's, that's the name uh -huh. of the place. It was a 36 panel piece. And it was about, I don't know, about 36 feet long, I think, or 33 feet long. And um, those are all panels that had come back from previous exhibitions that I'd come back and I worked on them again, you know. But it was such a thrill to work on a painting that, uh, <laughs> you know, I'd done maybe uh, five or six years earlier and hadn't quite gotten, you know, where I wanted to be. But uh, to go back there with knowing what I know now, you know, was, so I wish I could do that to all of them, <laughs> you know, get them all back so I could work on them again. Oh my gosh. There's another one. This one's like really interesting because it's got this opaque, um, you know, paint in it that really is a contrast to some of those other ones that are much more translucent and glowing. Well, it's, it's the same process. And um, the way I work, I, I usually have, um, uh, very solid kind of underpainting underneath that has kind of light and dark things going on and and some sort of form and then I start putting glazes over the top of it and when the glazes are wet I put maybe a, a, a an opaque white uh, glaze over the top of that and, and just start working it down in various ways and uh, I just love that you know I, I I live out here and I I hear like metal arcs and I that's my favorite bird song. And uh, they're very complicated. You know, you listen to a metal arc and it's got this incredible sound. And, um, and it's very much a part of the land, you know? And you, uh, so I, I think about bird song a lot when I'm painting. I think I've got one more image from your show and then we'll uh, talk about this a little bit and maybe move into questions that are being sent to me as we're speaking. Um, this one's really very orange. It's really a very bright piece um, titled Howl. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of those paintings uh, of that, that uh, series. You know, it, it's, um, it has many layers there. And I, uh, you know, I, I, I never say I tried to do something. I just do something. And if it works out, it does. If it doesn't, uh, I work over the top of it. So this is one of those paintings that I just kept working on until it arrived, you know. One day, and a, a lot of times they might arrive and I don't notice it, you know. I just, I don't notice it until the next day I come back to the studio and say, ah, <laughs> okay. So this has been great. I, I want to keep talking, but I think that um, it might make sense for us to start responding to some of these questions that are coming through. Um, the first one I just want to put out there is that um, we have someone who's saying that your work seems to have a strong kinship to Turner. Um, has this been brought up before? Have other people compared your work in terms of working well, with I've intense light and color? I, I love Turner. You know, I mean, Turner was that uh, that artist that uh, sort of, uh, uh, I mean, the legend of Turner on a ship strapping himself to uh, the mast and during a storm, you know, at sea, you know, uh, that that whole idea of energy in a painting and uh, that the artist is is the storm, you know, <laughs> is is the uh, the energy to make that uh, uh, thing happen, that event. Uh, so Turner, but Turner and everybody else, you know, I I I, I like to say I stole something from everybody. You know, I, I, there isn't a, a painter out there that I haven't learned something from. That's great. Who are Both. some of your favorite painters besides Turner? Like, who, who are you looking at? Who gets you excited? Well, right now, I'm not looking at anybody, but um, I, I used to. <laughs> you know, I, um, I don't know what's going on today. You know, I'm just, 
anyway, I, you know, when I was coming up, uh, when I was young, uh, I loved, uh, uh, especially uh, on here, there, there was a lot of Charlie Russell, you know, my dad loved Charlie Russell. And um, he always thought I should put, uh, you know, like an Indian on horseback or an elk or whatever, you know, he thought, mm -hmm. you know, you need something in there, you know, because there's nothing in there. And I, <laughs> I uh, uh, we used to, he's, he told me he was going to be my my hardest critic, and he was, you know, we argued about art, you know, my dad, I, we'd just get in a big argument about a painting or something like that. And uh, years later, years later, <laughs> when he was uh, about to leave this world, he came to live with me for a little while. And uh, he was uh, using morphine for pain. And he was sitting in front of my painting, one of my paintings, and he, he, uh, he said, you know, you're right. And I thought he was just going to get into another, <laughs> an, another argument. And uh, I said, right about what? And he said, you don't need to have anything in there. He said, I can see all kinds of stuff in that. I said, oh, thank you, Dad. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. That's wonderful. That's great. Great validation. Do you, um, I do think that it is good in a way sometimes to be challenged, you know, to, to be forced to defend your beliefs or what you're doing or why you're doing it. I think it, it's, it's good to have to explain that, no, you know, I, I think it might help you. Working class family and, um, you know, an artist. Yeah. Nobody, nobody, nobody knew an artist, let alone, you know, my, I mean, my mother uh, was an artist. She painted and drew, but it wasn't uh, like a profession. Like that. So there wasn't that concept in my family, you know, everybody did things, you know, I had an uncle that was a, a country western musician and a railroad worker, you know, and uh, other uncle that was an expert machinist, you know, um, uh, they're all people that lived here on the reservation, you know, they had, uh, uh, I don't know, they were self-sufficient people. They. Uh, they thought art was, uh, they didn't know what art was, you know, and, and so it was very curious thing as uh, I was growing up and, and um, they were curious about what I was doing. I wish I could show them all today, you know, how it turned out. All right, so here's an interesting question. I have to ask this one because we've been talking so much about color. Someone asked, have you ever contemplated doing a series of white paintings? <laughs> so going back back to where you started in a way like, stepping away from color <laughs> i'm a painter you know <laughs> <laughs> i could see painting white on black but not not a white painting not monochromatic no. yeah that... i do monochrome you know i used to I do monochrome um how do you know this is another question how do you know an individual panel is a standalone work rather than part of a multi-panel series mm. Well, that's, uh, that, that's one of the things I do is I sit for hours or maybe days and weeks and just look <laughs> at what I've done. And um, really the paintings uh, fit together, you know, in, in a uh, pattern when they begin to, usually I start with one or two paintings and then start building out a composition that way. I don't have the entire thing uh, available. Sometimes it takes, a year or two to be able to really complete a uh, composition just to have the right painting. So, um. yeah, I think a lot of people are. I, I see a couple of different questions here that have that you've kind of been talking about as you go along about how you determine which pieces go together and you know the rearranging, how how that process is, and um, so that's fascinating. Okay, let's see. Let me pause the sharing. That says pause. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment and just see if we can pull up any more questions from the chat. There's quite a few. Um, oh, <laughs> what musical background are you listening to these days? <laughs> and you've talked about music influencing your work before. Yeah, I have. I I, I listen to music. Um, right now, I'm I'm just sort of. I don't have anything I'm listening to, you know. Um, 
I went through several years where I, I, I listened to a lot of jazz and um, uh, um, a lot of my titles are taken from uh, music. Uh, um, but right now I, I'm, I'm not listening to music. All right. Um, well, we're getting to about 6.45. I'm going to um, have say a few words about the um, sponsors of this event. Um, one of the things that um, has been really important to me since I arrived here and started working um, at the Portland Art Museum is the Native American Art Council. Um, let me see, here we go. I have a slide about it just to let people know about it. Um, so the Native American Art Council is one of several different art councils that support different departments of the museum. Um, it's a real special group. It's a group of people who have a particular interest in Native American art. And when you become a member of the council, um, you're invited to events like this. Um, before the pandemic, we did all of these great events. Um, we had things happening almost every month. We organized trips. Um, and you can see there's a really nice um, hospitality spread there. And it was a great way to meet other people with similar interests. Um, but the council also is a really important uh, source of support for the Native American um, art program at the museum. So that in includes um, helping to sponsor artist talks and um, different programs. Some are exclusive for members um, and some are public programs. Um, they've also helped, even just since I've been here, they've helped um, add to our collection, sponsoring acquisitions for the collection. So I really encourage um, all of you out there who might not be a member of the Native American Art Council, if you are already a member of the Portland Art Museum, this would be a great way to become even more involved. Um, right now, I think that, you know, having these virtual programs has been really wonderful and I have a feeling they're probably are going to continue to a certain degree because we've all learned that this is a really wonderful way to reach people. Um, James, right now you're you're able to do this from your home, from your studio, and um, you know that's that's great. Um, so please consider uh, joining the council. Um, I want to thank Jane Beebe and just bring her back on the screen. Um, Jane, if you could come back, I'd love to uh, have you. Uh, tell folks about how they can see this amazing and exciting and intense work in person. I, I would love to have people come visit the gallery. You can come see Jim's show, Expecting Rain. We're, right now our hours are Wednesday through Saturday, 10 to four, but you can make an appointment for other times if that doesn't fit into your life. And um, I do wanna thank both of you so much for your conversation. As many times as I've listened to you, Jim, I can always learn more and I'll never tired of it. <laughs> and I'll never be tired of looking at your paintings. They're so wonderful. Um, I also wanna thank uh, Charles Campbell from the Portland Art Museum and uh, Jordan Piper at PDX for your assistance in this. And um, I'm hoping everybody will join the Native Art Council and come visit us. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.